Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the St. Luke's Health Talk series, where we bring virtual live opportunities to you and our community members. If you want to find, or to you, our community members, if you want to find additional offerings, please go to stlukesonline.org backslash health talks. I'm Sarah Higgerly with Community Health. Today we have a disclaimer for our recording. Next slide, please. The information in this video should not be construed as medical advice. The video is property of St. Luke's and will be made available to you for educational purposes for a short time. We also have a housekeeping slide and tips for our virtual live event. You have the opportunity to type questions today through the chat feature. There is a Q and A icon on your screen, typically on the right hand side. Click on it to click on ask a question, type your question and click the airplane icon to send. Um, we will be moderating those posts and look for posts or announcements throughout the chat. Our health talk today is Lifestyle of Medicine with Nancy Taylor. Lifestyle medicine empowers people with knowledge and skills to help you achieve better overall health and greater quality of life. Nancy is a nurse practitioner with our St. Luke's Lifestyle Medicine Department. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you for talking with us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So, um, first, I would just like for everyone who joined us today, Happy New Year. Um, I know we're in the 10th of January now, and um, one of the reasons I think that it's very fun to talk about lifestyle as medicine right now is the new year is often seen as uh, a time where we can set new goals, have new beginnings, um, and is often a time that can lead to frustration at times because sometimes the, the goals or resolutions um, don't last past maybe that first month or so. Um, and so I'm hoping today to kind of talk about what are some good things that we can do, um, what does the research tell us is recommended for us, and then really um, even touch on maybe some strategies and things that can help us if we're wanting to use lifestyle as medicine. So I'd like to start by just kind of laying the groundwork for why do we talk about lifestyle as medicine. Um, it, you know, lifestyle medicine became became its own um, subspecialty in medicine about 15 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago now, actually. Um, and it really is this idea that how do we use the choices we make um, to help us be healthier and, and more importantly, improve our quality of life, make it so that I have the energy to do what I want to do um, and spend the time with the people I want to spend time with. So sort of kind of what we're really um, kind of trying to address here is this idea of chronic disease in in our country and many would argue worldwide actually. Um, but I think it's important to kind of know what we're talking about here. Um, you know, chronic disease is something that you have for um, more than three to six months. And it's typically something that, um, because it develops over time, um, is something that we typically don't catch from someone else, but we can have long-term um, issues related to having an infectious disease. We all know that from, you know, historically things like polio or even now with COVID, the long COVID syndrome that's happening. So, but what we really talk about a lot are things that, um, you know, things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, those kinds of things. It's, it is a pretty significant problem. You know, six in 10 Americans will have a chronic disease. Um, but if we think about it, four in 10 have two or more of those. About 40% of us will be diagnosed with some type of cancer during our lifetimes. And half of all Americans have cardiovascular disease of some type. Um, so it is something that we um, know can cause real problems with the way that we live our lives and we want to try to do everything we can to kind of manage those. Um, one of the ones that we hear about and I wanted to mention is this idea of prediabetes. Um, 
there's a lot in the media now. One in three adults has prediabetes. And what's significant about that is if that doesn't, uh, if things don't change on a trajectory for the individual, then likely they will develop type 2 diabetes. And that has its own health risks, things like the heart disease, kidney issues, um, increasing our risk for stroke, those kinds of things. So it's one of those things that um, we know is sort of under the surface. Um, if we want to talk about things um, impacting sort of the community at large, with I think it's important to know that if we have diabetes, um, our health our health costs are going to be 2.3 times higher than someone who doesn't have it. So there's lots of things that that can really have an impact on. But what does that mean to me as an individual? That's a you know it's great when we're talking about the community and public health. This happens to be a community talk, so good to think about those things. But what about me as the individual? Well, ultimately, what we know is that if I have um, some of these things like heart disease, you can actually see that um, I have a higher risk of having a disability related to that. And what that means is it impacts my ability to do the things that I enjoy. Um, so we know that this can really um, be impactful for us as the individual. And again, also for the community, one in four adults has some type of disability that makes it hard for them in their daily lives and how they contribute to the community. So kind of in laying that groundwork again about why would we pay attention to this stuff? Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about sort of the stuff that's been out there about life expectancy recently, um, but we are noticing that um, life expectancy for the first time is not continuing to go up. And what this slide, which is really busy, and I don't, I won't get too much into the nitty gritty of it, but what I want to point out is that the lower part uh, of this will is is how much is spent, the money spent on healthcare, and the left hand side of it is really focused on years of life. And what you find with the United States is that we far outspend any of the other countries on this slide, but life expectancy doesn't follow that. Um, places where people live the longest um, are not spending near the amount that we do on healthcare. And so it really kind of leads us to beg the question, what are other things that we can do uh, that will help us improve that quality of life not only add years to the life, which is always valuable, but also life to the years. So um, that will be some of the stuff that we we try to address with lifestyle medicine. OK, um, this just gives us an example of where the US is compared to other nations from a life expectancy standpoint. And what I would say to you is that this is really um, actually dated data, meaning that we are not still typically at 79 years. Our life expectancy is actually going the other direction. So um, it is one of those things that we think that we can have a direct impact on in making our choices. Um, and healthcare costs. I mean, we all know that it that healthcare can be an expensive proposition. And again, nationally, you know, these are some numbers that really address sort of what we spend money on in the United States every year. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is that this prevention box up on the left hand side of this teeter totter um, is actually a fairly reasonable price tag compared to some of the other things that we see on the right side. So if we can support um, prevention and shifting that, that can be um, really impactful for cost. I do always like to bring it back to us as the individuals though, right? Because, you know, it's great if it doesn't cost as much, um, but, you know, it, we can bring that down to me as the individual as well, because if I'm not having to pay for a number of medications, um, 
additional visits to see healthcare providers, those kinds of things, or shifting how that works, that can be impactful to our lives for sure. All right, so what we also know is that if something is preventable, if we never have to worry about it, that can be a really nice um, thing for us living our daily lives, right? Um, and if I have had a disease, um, can I do things in a way that it has less of an impact on my daily life and how I live? Those are things that we, we can think about. Um, the World Health Organization and CDC published data, and this has been uh, a few years ago now, back in 2017, that said we can prevent illness uh, up to about 80% of cardiovascular diseases, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and 40% of cancers. But it does, it, that data looked at specific behaviors. So things like having a healthy diet or nutrition, uh, avoiding tobacco in any form, um, if we're consuming alcohol, doing so only in moderation, and being, um, physically active. Those four things done consistently have the potential to eliminate 80% of cardiovascular diseases, prevent them 40% of cancer. So those are pretty big numbers when we think about what is that, what, are, what kind of return are we getting on, on what we're doing for our health. So the American Hospital Association actually a while ago did some research and looked at, again, this was 2000, 2017, looked at what impacts our health as individuals. And you can see on this um, pie chart that basically, you know, genetics plays a role. Um, certainly having access to health and medical care plays a role and physical environment can play a role. By that, we mean things like, do I have clean water to drink? Do I live somewhere where there's a lot of air pollution? Those kinds of things. Um, but behaviors, what we do on a daily basis, and our social circumstances play the biggest role. Those two combined play the biggest role. Now, a lot of things we don't directly have uh, control over, things like economic stability, housing, transportation, those kinds of things. But that's where uh, our public health services can actually come in and play a role as well. But what we're talking about today and what I hope to share with you is sort of what optimally we as individuals can strive toward to make that the big difference, trying to put as much control back in our hands as we can, knowing that we don't have control of everything. OK, um, let's keep forging ahead. So what puts us at risk for developing a chronic disease? And these have been pretty well studied. Um, and the first four I've actually already talked about. And we're going to talk about what are these things actually. So um, poor diet, uh, being inactive, tobacco, alcohol consumption. Those were the four that the World Health Organization identified that we could have a big uh, key impact on. Now, there's other things that factor into this as well. So genetics. We all get a certain number of DNA from our parents. We can't trade that back in and get something we like better. Um, but what we have learned over the last 15, 20 years is that we have an ability to influence our genes. So my genes come with switches and through the choices I make, I have some ability to influence when that gene gets turned on and when it gets turned off. That's an area of study epigenetics. Uh, they've done twin studies. They've done studies on prostate cancer. There's a lot that shows that our environment and our habits can have an influence on, on that, which is hopefully encouraged to anybody who feels like you may not have won the, the uh, genetics lottery. Um, so carrying excess weight. We know that fatty tissue is hormonally active and that can contribute to increased risk for certain diseases. Emotional distress. That's one that we've heard more and more about over the past few years, really identifying that that constant 
release of stress hormones can really have an impact on um, our overall physical health. Um, and having strategies that help us with that is important. This idea of adverse childhood events, if I'm exposed to toxic stress as a child, if I'm emotionally, physically, sexually abused as a child, uh, if I witness domestic violence, if I grow up in a war-torn country, um, those are things that can have an impact on increasing my risk for chronic disease if I'm not helped to find a healthy way to manage that. Um, so definitely this can play a role in our physical health. So poor sleep. Um, we know that getting good quantity and quality of sleep are both important. And so we can talk more about that in a minute, which is important. Now, the one thing that we can't directly impact is age. We all get a year older every year, um, but I think it's important, like I said earlier, to look at how do we add not only years to the life, but life to the years. Um, and there's a great book title I love that's called Die Young as Late as Possible. And that's what we're really striving for. Okay, so we've talked about sort of the what and the why, and now I'd like to spend just a minute or two talking about the how. Why does it make a difference uh, what I eat or how I move or any of those things in my risk for chronic disease? And essentially, it comes back to our body's defense mechanism, which is the immune system. When we have um, an injury, any kind of injury. We cut ourselves, we get a snake bite, we sprain our ankle. Our immune system recognizes that there's an injury going on and it sends a bunch of things to uh, the site of that injury. Uh, cytokines, proteins, white blood cells, all kinds of things. And often, you know, I'm gonna pick on the sprained ankle. Often if our if that happens, our ankle will swell up, it will get red, it will get painful, and that usually cues us into, okay, I need to rest that thing, I maybe need to put compression on it, or if it's uncomfortable, I can put ice on it for comfort, um, all of those kinds of things. And then the immune system will say, okay, we're not having that injury ongoing, and things will start returning to normal. But if we think about it, and our ankle is sprained three times a day for 50 years, there's there's a point where that's not going to be helpful for it anymore. So if we're if something is causing injury on the inside of our body that we're not seeing, then it can lead to this sort of excessive immune response where the immune system constantly over and over again sends all of those same same things. And it results in this sort of cascade of things that can happen, as you see on the screen. We have these inflammatory proteins precursors, we're chronically inflamed, and it leads to things like insulin resistance, which lead to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Increased risk of developing blood clots um, that can block up arteries in our brain or in our heart, uh, direct tissue damage that can happen. Um, and then, you know, it our, our blood vessels function in a certain way, but if there's constant inflammation, they don't open and close as well as they should. They maybe get lumpy bumpy on the inside and blood flow is impacted. Um, so it's a way that we know that the body is trying to repair, but we don't get that feedback, so we don't always have that same motivation. So that's why, um, when we're talking about lifestyle medicine, we don't necessarily just talk about one thing, right? Everything we do can be helpful to the heart, to the lungs, to the brain, to the kidneys, uh, to our bones. Um, all those things can be helped in looking at how do I decrease this inflammation in the body? Okay, so now let's talk about what lifestyle medicine focuses on. And and as Sarah mentioned earlier, really is looking at what are the therapeutic interventions that we can use to prevent, treat, and possibly reverse chronic diseases. And in the, in the circle to the left, these are all of the things that we focus on. Physical activity, eating healthy foods, uh, primarily whole plant foods, and we'll talk about that. Developing strategies that I can manage um, stress when it comes at me, when that person cuts me off on the highway, I have a toolkit already developed to help me with that. Um, 
forming and maintaining good healthy relationships, getting good quality sleep, and taking care of any toxins that we might be, be using. So um, lifestyle medicine, as I said, is its own subspecialty. Um, all of, uh, you know, there is a certification that people can get to really learn the best research and the ways to, to help you with um, implementing this in your own lives, which we think is the, is the big key. So lifestyle medicine essentially focuses on, you can read the mission uh, that we have on the side there, but essentially what lifestyle medicine focuses on is how do we get to the root cause of the disease? If chronic disease is the water on the floor here and the healthcare workers that are the characters are using their tools, their mops, those are our medications, our procedures, our surgeries, we're working to manage that. But if we can get to the root of it, which gets back to the faucet, how do I slow down or turn off that faucet? It's gonna be hard to get ahead of that, right? And so lifestyle medicine works at getting to that root cause of disease. So this is really just a review of that screen, the, the circle that we looked at earlier. So we're gonna look at in, increasing our intake of whole, meaning not processed foods, and mostly plants. We're gonna optimize our sleep. We wanna get good quality, good quantity. We're gonna have those relationships that help us um, renew us, um, and really making sure that we have that sense of purpose as we're moving forward. Um, being active in whatever way that we enjoy being active. And then also decreasing our use of substances that we know aren't good for us. And then learning our skills that when we are feeling kind of down, what's going to help us uh, manage when those things come at us? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about each of these things a little bit. Um, I do wanna make sure that we leave enough time for um, questions at the end. So I, uh, I will apologize in advance if I skip over something, but please do ask questions uh, when we get to that section as well. All right, so what health habit is the number one cause of chronic illness? Um, I don't have the ability to hear back from you what you guys are thinking. But what I can tell you, if you are, if you have health goals and you want to um, see something make change um, quickly, one of the main things we can work on is nutrition. Essentially, what we want to do, um, and what I would tell you, aside from eating whole foods and uh, monitoring how much sodium we take in, one of the things that I encourage people to focus on the most is, am I getting the recommended amount of plants in my nutrition? Fiber is likely the nutrient most of us are deficient in, and we only get fiber from plants. And you can see all the colors over on the right side of that screen. Um, all of those colors give us phytonutrients, antioxidants, they help bring down inflammation. Um, so I encourage people, look at where you have opportunity to add things in, and we'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, one of the things that um, I like to share is the reason we talk about what you eat is if I've given up something, say I've been recommended to give up red meat, and instead I'm having a bag of Oreos, I haven't really made a positive change there. So it, it matters what we substitute in. All right, so we do have lots of research. I'm gonna to touch briefly on these things. I have no idea what interest you all would have, but I wanted to list them in case you're interested. In 2017, again, they published this uh, Global Burden of Disease study where they looked at 195 countries that again found in those countries where people got the recommended amount of plants, so they had a high, uh, high intake of fruits and vegetables, low intake of sodium, that this, these were the countries where people had uh, the lowest disease rates and they lived longest. So that's, a, that's one that really reinforces the important about what we eat matters. Um, again, this was another one, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation published that um, dietary is a big one. It, 
tobacco's third. So dietary is really impactful. And if we look at what we need to be eating, it really talks about um, that we want to get um, adequate amounts of all these things. Um, and it has the potential to save one in five lives every year, simply through nutrition, what we eat. So this is the food pyramid that we use here at Lifestyle Medicine, and it really focuses again on what am I eating and where do I have room to add things in? So starting at the bottom, four to six servings of vegetables a day, but you shouldn't be hungry. You can have as many of those as you want. Uh, two to four servings of fruit a day, again, as much color as possible. One, one half to one and a half cups of beans and lentils a day. Um, that's one that I always caution people, if you're not eating those every day, don't jump to one and a half cups. Uh, you do um, experience a fair amount of gas when you increase these in your nutrition, so it can be a little uncomfortable. We got to get used to that much fiber. Um, three to four servings of whole grains a day. Uh, whole grains are things like oatmeal, quinoa, millet, tuff, buckwheat, farro, pearl barley, uh, couscous, brown rice. All of those things are whole grains. Um, one to two servings of nut seeds and avocado. Then over and above that, if I still am not at the health goals I want, eggs, oil, fish, poultry, dairy should be less than 10% of calories. And then our processed and red meats, refined sugars, cheese, which is actually the highest saturated fat food, uh, and any processed foods, we want to kind of limit those, rarely if ever have them. All of this goes back to the idea of how do I keep my gut microbiome healthy? And it goes back to fiber. I did include a resource list um, that will be available to you that lists a variety of books, cookbooks, some documentaries and things like that. So um, that can be something that you can look at if you want more information on this idea of the gut microbiome. Always, 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 I like to say this is never all or nothing. Um, we often can get caught in, I'm going to do a full 180 and do something completely different. Um, and then three days later, I'm tossing up my hands and I can't sustain that. And so I'm going back to what I was doing. Small steps uh, and wins and successes help us be successful at making those sustainable changes. So you can see that on this eating continuum, this plate in the middle, perfectly healthy uh, approach to eating, right? So if I'm eating fast food three times a day and drinking two liters of soda, it might even be as simple as, I'm gonna drop it to one liter of soda and not eat fast food for one meal, right? Or whatever makes sense for you. We wanna make sure that we're making those steps toward the healthier way of eating. Okay, um, as we move on to the other pillars of lifestyle that we talk about, physical activity is one that we have quite a bit of research about. Um, the website where the physical activity guidelines are, are on there. You certainly can go in and peruse those, but I think the message I would like to share with you is use exercise as medicine. Um, I will give you the example of if I'm diabetic and I'm using insulin with my meals, one way to use exercise as medicine is plan to take a walk, a five to 10 minute walk after I eat, to use that exercise as a way to um, manage that glucose uh, like I would the medicine. So that's just an example of a possibility that we could do. All right, four parts of being physically active though. And physically active is a term I use intentionally. Most people think exercise when I say that term, but one of the main things that we can do to make ourselves healthier is to limit sitting. Um, sitting for prolonged periods of time is not good for us, and we live in a society that promotes it, right? We work in front of computers, um, we play video games, we can sit and do that. Um, we can watch whole seasons of TV shows now. Um, so lots of things that make it so that we can sit for prolonged periods of time, but getting up and moving around is incredibly important. In fact, if I go out and take a 30 minute walk in the morning, 
If I go home and spend the rest of the day on the couch, I've actually negated some of the benefit that I got from that walk. So getting up and moving around a little bit every hour, very powerful for improving my health. All right, and then aerobic exercise where we actually get that heart rate in that range. Doing something we really like uh, will help us be successful at that. If I don't like to mountain bike, and that's what I want. That's what I'm doing for exercise. It's going to be hard to make myself continue to do that, right? Um, we need to find things that we can enjoy and often incorporate um, either social aspects or something that will help us enjoy what we're doing. Targeting 150 minutes of having our heart rate in that range every week minimum. If I do more than that, I get more benefit. Lots of things can get in our way here too, right? Um, I have a joint that hurts or um, I'm busy at work or I have young kids at home. Schedule is really hard for me to fit this in. Um, we don't have to do it all at once. It doesn't have to look a certain way. I can do 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. These, are, you know, finding ways to work around the barriers of what we're doing is important. Now, if I'm having joint pain, one of the things that can really help me is making sure that I'm doing some resistance training of some type. If I strengthen muscles around the joint, uh, that's gonna help decrease my pain in that joint. Same thing with stretching. The resistance training is important even as we're getting older. As a matter of fact, we move, lose muscle mass more quickly as we age. So it is really important for us to maintain as much muscle mass as we can. There have been studies that show we still can build muscle even when we're older. Uh, a lot of the studies we look at, they, they are done with people who are older than the age of 50. So it shows it's never too late for this stuff. Um, and stretching, also very good for joint health, very good for chronic pain in our back. Uh, yoga and Tai Chi, lots of studies out there about the positive benefit of those. Um, always good to find places or people that can help you start to do those things safely. Um, and it is good if you have any concern at all, talk with your uh, physician or provider, making sure that you're good to go with an exercise routine before you start it. Okay. Um, I want to touch briefly on weight um, because of, you know, knowing that fatty tissue can increase our risk for certain diseases. In healthcare, we look at weight a couple of different ways. One is body mass index, uh, which is not a perfect measurement because I can be really skinny on top, really skinny on the bottom, and carry my weight around my middle, which we know through research increases my risk for certain diseases, um, which is one reason we'll also often look at waist circumference. So for women, we want to target um, being 35 inches or less, unless we're of Asian descent, in which would be 30 inches or less. Men, 40 inches or less, unless we're Asian descent, and then we want it to be 35 inches or less. So um, all of these things we can look at with when we're looking at excess weight, but what I would really want you to take away from this discussion around weight is that it does not take a big change to have a positive impact on our health. Um, what we know is that if I carry excess and I calculate five to 10% of my weight, if I lose that, if that's a goal, then that's the point at which providers are often talking to you about, gosh, maybe we need to lower your blood pressure medicine, or maybe we need to decrease the diabetes medicines you're on. Um, that's the point at which we really recognize metabolically you have become healthier. Inflammation has decreased on the inside and you are working on improving any chronic diseases you might be dealing with. Okay, um, but Luckily, we've learned also that our head's attached to our body, so we pay attention to that now. I will tell you, early in my career, that was not a big focus um, where I worked in healthcare. And I'm excited to say that um, we know that um, if, if we ignore this completely, we can... It, we can really miss an opportunity. I don't know if any of you have ever, you know, felt anxious about something, maybe, you know, giving a presentation or getting cut off on the freeway and somebody, you know, you're really mad at the person in the other car, maybe even yelling at them. You know, your body is responding by sending a lot of stress hormones out 
um, and your heart's racing and you might get red in the face or, you know, you just feel like, you know, I, I had one patient tell me that they felt like their blood was boiling, their head was going to pop off. Um, you know, we know that that's not good for us. And over the long term, if that happens chronically, it really can be bad for our health. And so building up that toolkit that I mentioned earlier, where we have something already in place that we can depend on. So this idea of being positive psychology, using positive psychology to combat this. And there's ways that we can do that. Um, and what we're actually learning is that this can actually change the chemistry in our brains and the way our brains work. Um, but this idea of having a purpose, what am I getting out of bed for in the morning? Uh, when we're kids, I'm getting up to go play with my friends. When I'm an adult, maybe I'm getting up to go to work or I'm raising my family. When I retire, I have to figure out what that purpose is moving forward. What am I feeling passionate about? What do I want to spend my time doing? Um, I had one gentleman I talked to who said, I've been retired 40 years. I've changed my purpose three times. So, you know, being intentional about that is important. Um, this idea of the social engagement and connection, working on our relationships, definitely not talking volume here. We can be in a room with 100 people and feel lonely. What we want is to have those people that sort of renew our energy. Um, really can be something that we have to be intentional about and work at. Um, so I think it is something that we should pay attention to. Um, one of the main researchers for positive psychology is Dr. Martin Seligman, and he will often say, do you have that person that you can call at three o'clock in the morning if you need something? So that's a way to look at it. Um, and then this idea of being positively positive, you know, maybe developing a gratitude practice. Again, we're trying to rewire the way things work in the brain um, or paying attention to how we feel. If I'm feeling a little grumpy, maybe I don't want to go home and watch a dark drama. Maybe I need to turn on the comedy and, and have someone entertain me um, or get outside and enjoy nature a little bit if I'm not feeling all that positive. Um, and then using this idea of mindfulness and meditation, mindfulness being aware of what's going on with us in the moment. Um, you know, this is where multitasking can cause tr trouble. You know, if I'm eating, I want to be mindful about what am I eating? How does it taste? Those kinds of things. Or if I'm in a conversation with somebody, I want to be mindful of what they're saying. What's their mood? What's the message they're trying to get across? Whereas meditation can be more about um, not getting in a lotus position and burning incense as much as paying attention to my breathing. How am I feeling? Um, trying to empty the mind, not letting stressors get get to me, those kinds of things. So really a lot we can do with this. All right, sleep. Hopefully I haven't put anyone out there to sleep over your lunch hour. Um, we know that um, getting seven to nine hours of sleep as an adult uh, is the recommendation. Everybody's a little bit different. Some people need a little more, some people need a little less, but it's important that we get restorative sleep. If I'm waking up as tired as I was when I went to bed, that can be a problem. Or if I um, really have a hard time falling asleep or I can't stay asleep all night long because I'm waking up thinking about everything I have to do the next day. Um, all of those things can be problematic. So creating routines around sleep can be really important. There's a lot of, um, good information out there about what can help us improve sleep. One thing we do need to think about, though, is do I have sleep apnea? Because I know that if I'm snoring really loudly, the neighbors are knocking on the door saying, hey, can you keep it down in there? We're trying to sleep. Or, um, you know, people can hear me down the hallway in my house. Um, that can be a sign of sleep apnea. And the reason that's important is because my brain is 30% more active at night. If I'm not getting all the oxygen that I need, um, and if I'm not getting the time of sleep for the brain to do all the work it needs to do, it can impact how my brain functions the next day, and over time can impact how my brain functions as I get older. Um, one of the things that we also think is pretty important is paying attention to how that can impact our other chronic diseases. If I'm diabetic, I'm gonna have a harder time controlling my blood glucoses if I have untreated sleep apnea. 
Um, or I'm at increased risk for atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heart rhythm that we know that that can cause problems with. Or simply, I'm trying to lose weight. I'm having a hard time doing it. And it's because my body's releasing the hunger hormone when I don't get enough sleep because it's trying to get me more energy. So all of these things tie in together. It's inter I always think it's interesting because I'm talking about these things separately, but they all work together. And so um, and we each have different things that uh, we have opportunity uh, to work on. Doesn't mean we're going to want to work on all of them, but you know, it's going to be a little bit different for each of us. Okay, getting to the end of the uh, talking part, so I hope we have some questions. Uh, substances. We know that, uh, and often you'll hear this referred to in medical literature as toxins, um, but Tobacco, no safe level of tobacco. Um, we know that that is, in, anytime we introduce anything into the lungs, it can leave microparticulates and cause chronic lung disease. Uh, recreational drug use. Um, again, we don't have a lot of research on this. We're getting some on marijuana since it's available, you know, legal in some places now. But again, I would reinforce inhaling anything into your lungs is not good. That's why people who live in areas that have high uh, air pollution rates have higher uh, rates of chronic lung disease. So we want to avoid that. Alcohol, um, this one's where we get a little bit different in the research. Cardiovascular guidelines in the US are what you're seeing on the screen. That's how they define moderate consumption. In uh, in Europe, they've dropped that to one a day, regardless of gender. And part of that was driven by uh, the cancer research that's out there that has linked uh, consumption of alcohol to increased risk of development of a variety of cancers. Um, so they've come out uh, at least a couple times and said, we don't think people should drink. Um, they do qualify it and say, if we're staying below five beverages uh, a week, we have less risk, it doesn't say no risk, but less risk than people who drink more than that. Um, I do want to quantify though what a, of what a beverage is. It's a five ounce glass of wine, 12 ounce beer, one and a half ounce spirit. That's what's been used in the research. Okay, um, last but not least, I really want to talk about um, kind of behavior change, because that's what we we talked about right at the beginning, right? How do I make a sustainable behavior change for that resolution that I set in, you know, on January 1 and now here on January 10th, I'm like, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. What we have to really embrace is that change is uh, a journey that we set out on. It is not a straight line from point A to point B. There's lots of starts and stops and redirections. Sometimes we get a barrier that we can't go through. We got to go around it. You know, all of these things that we figure out as we're doing it. Um, but the important thing is that we're striving for progress, not perfection. Uh, we just need to keep at it. So um i am uh actually done at this point there is a yeah, video here right now as far that as I... um will be available to you through the links if you would like it shows uh, one of our patients journeys um but that's it i'm open i'm open to questions well thanks nancy that was really insightful and helpful you gave a lot of information, which is good, and um, people can watch this later. We hope to post them on YouTube. So um, look at your registration, or the information that I send out after the uh, this webinar. Um, there is a question and it says, can you repeat a few easy ways to improve our health? Okay. Yes, I can. Um, and I'll touch on each of the pillars as I do that. So with physical activity, I think one of the easiest ways to improve your health is to make sure that you're not sitting for prolonged periods of time. Get up and move around. Um, that's an easy one. Doesn't take any equipment. Um, it can be challenging if we have pain, um, but getting help um, to kind of manage that and figure out ways to do that. What we know with osteoarthritis and those kinds of things, anybody who's felt a little stiff in the morning, getting up and moving around often helps that. 
um, nutrition, limit processed food, eat more whole foods, meaning as close to as grown as possible, and as many plants as we can eat. Um, with our emotional wellness, foster good relationships, uh, maintain that social connection, um, and be as positive as we can be. Um, manage our weight, maintain a healthy weight if possible. Um, and I'm kind of running through these in my head. Um, avoid uh, substances as much as possible. Um, and, oh, what am I missing? Sarah, I usually have this right um, in front of me. Did Physical you say activity. sleep? Sleep, sleep. sleep. Okay, yeah, good quality sleep, <laughs> adequate quantity, good quality. Awesome. That's an, a great recap and it it kind of highlights some um, things that you could do as your New Year's or everyday resolution, like how do I improve my health? OK, I'm going to start today and do one night of going to bed early and doing the best I can or, you know, focus on things for a short time until it becomes um, habit, right? Mm -hmm. OK. There's another comment that said uh, they have no questions, but they wanted to thank you for providing the health talk. It was very insightful. 